Naman Dabts and Naman Dabts and Naman Dabts. Well, hello and welcome to Seattle Buddhist Temple's 2021 Eco Sangha Earth Day Seminar. My name is uh, Reverend Don Castro and I retired after 39 years as a minister with the Buddhist Churches of America and 31 of those years was with uh, Seattle Betsuin here. Um, and late in the late 1990s, I started promoting the idea of an eco sangha uh, based on an awareness that uh, to be a Buddhist is automatically to be an ecologist and a conservationist. And uh, you know, some people will say, "Well, Buddhism is not ecology." Well. The word ecology, the term ecology, has changed over time and it has broadened. So you have um, uh, ecology used uh, to, um, <laughs> in so many different ways, you can talk about you know, ecology of the family, ecology of a community, ecology of forest systems, e ecology of the body, you know, the body as an ecosystem, ecology, ecosystems are basic to to the idea of, of ecology and interdependence. And uh, the backbone of Buddhism is uh, the, the two-sided uh, awareness of impermanence and interdependence. Um, there are many different uh, levels and uh, you can go with that. But anyway, words change with time. And uh, there was, I think in the 1970s, uh, Professor uh, Francis Cook wrote a book called Hua Yun Buddhism and in that book he uh, referred to Buddhism as cosmic ecology and um, I, I agree with him but I think you have to take it a step further. Um, Buddhism, uh, ecology is, is scientific, I mean it's science, but Buddhism is scientific it's not science. It's uh, it's beyond science. It uh, includes values and the value of of life and the sacredness of life. And um, so, it uh, Buddhism is also uh, conservation. To be a Buddhist is automatically to be an ecologist and a conservationist. So, uh, and I think this goes along with. Uh, with a, the basic Buddhist approach of the Four Noble Truths. I think this is common to all, all denominations of Buddhism, is uh, that we adhere to the Four Noble Truths in our, own, in, in our own way and with our own interpretations. But certainly, uh, you know, the truth of, uh, of Dukkha, Dukkha is there's no English equivalent, but it just it means um, dissonance, dissatisfaction, um, pain, suffering. Suffering is one extreme of it, but it can, it can mean dissatisfaction and, and dissonance and um, things aren't right, things are out of kilter. And uh, so that is the, we say that is the symptom, that's what starts us on our journey, on our spiritual journey. An awareness that my, my life is not right uh, and I want to find out. Uh, I want to get peace of mind. So um, you have the symptom, diagnosis, that, that dukkha, that, that problem, those issues have a cause, and uh, uh, prognosis, that cause can be, uh, you can get to the root of that cause and then the uh, medicine. So uh, I think all of Buddhism falls into that, uh, into that medical model. Um, in the late 1990s, uh, my friend, who, artist uh, Kenji Tachibana, the late T Kenji, uh, just passed away uh, in the last year. And um, uh, uh, or a little, little beyond this last year. Uh, and he created a logo based on the story of uh, the Buddha's enlightenment, where um, uh, the Buddha is uh, 
assaulted um, by uh, by Mara, the great demon, the kind of devil figure in, in Buddhism, and uh, Mara manifests himself in various ways um, as uh, a seduct, uh, as trying to seduce the Buddha, as Mara's daughters uh, or Mara's armies uh, assail the Buddha. Um, he tries to sow doubt, and uh, the Buddha uh, calls. He touches the earth, and you'll see this posture throughout Buddhist countries. I haven't seen it in Japan, and I'm still uh, wonder why I haven't seen an earth-touching posture of the Buddha, the mudra in Japan, but in, almost, in all Buddhist countries, there's the earth-touching posture. And so uh, Kenji uh, Tachibana created this logo for, uh, for us. It says Iko Sangha. So there are, the, the Buddha is an Iko Buddha. He teaches the Iko Dharma, and it's preserved by the Iko Sangha. And we're using this to this logo to try to bring Buddhists together of all denominations. Well, one thing uh, that I have noticed over the years is that we can't seem to get together as various Buddhist denominations uh, to, to agree on, on certain forms of, of cooperation. Uh, we don't have one holiday in, in common. You know, in certain Buddhist countries you have uh, the birth of the Buddha on April 8th, and you have the Enlightenment on December the 8th, and you have his passing away in February. Um, and these are three different dates, but in the Theravada tradition uh, of Buddhism, you have uh, all of those observed in the, uh, the first full moon in, in May, in a, an observance called uh, Vesak. So, you know, we don't we don't quite seem to be able to to get together. But I think on Earth Day is a day that we can truly get together to be a Buddhist, not just to be a Jodo Shinshu Buddhist, or to be a Zen Buddhist, or to be a Shingon Buddhist, uh, or Japanese Buddhist, or Tibetan Buddhist, whatever. It's all Buddhists. To be a Buddhist means this is the way you look at life. You know, understanding these basic principles of, of Buddhism, uh, interdependence, profound sense of interdependence, mutual co-arising, um, kind of a mutual identity. That, um, and uh, uh, so some years ago, uh, this uh, uh, logo was uh, created, and we, we hope that uh, eco-sanghas will, uh, will be formed. and. Um, uh, and that we will be able to talk with each other, plan things together. Uh, the Buddhist Churches of America adopted an Eco Sangha resolution in 2015. Um, we have a mission statement that uh, if anyone is interested, please contact us and we can send you uh, the mission statement. We can send you a lot of information about Eco Sangha. And uh, the mission statement reads, as Buddhists, the Eco Sangha, and this was done, I should say, by uh, San Jose uh, Betsuin's Eco Sangha, and under the leadership of uh, Mrs. Karen Akahoshi. And it says, as Buddhist, the Eco Sangha of the San Jose Buddhist Church Betsuin recognizes we are interdependent with all of life. From this position of oneness, we ask what we can do for our environment. Uh, our goals are to promote understanding of the inherent ecological nature of Buddhism, ecologically friendly behavior through the established guidelines, and recognition of the profound implications of our behavior on future generations. And that is certainly something on Earth Day that we ponder. You know, the, uh, we recognize the profound implications of our behavior on future generations. I uh, have three grandchildren, and I, I worry so much about their future. Three grandchildren and two on the way. So uh, they, uh, being born um, in 2021, 
could easily live to see the beginning of the next century. And uh, I hope that uh, it will be one where we can appreciate the beauty of the earth and be talking about the beauty of the earth uh, uh, and not be overwhelmed by the peril and uh, the crisis, uh, climate crisis that we are facing today. Um, so the Buddha touches the earth and he calls upon Mother Earth to witness his enlightenment. And that is what um, drives away Mara. And the earth today, Mother Earth will bear witness as to whether we are fools or whether we have a sense of, uh, some sense of wisdom and are able to implement it. Um, today, uh, the format of uh, the seminar uh, will be, uh, first we will have a, a talk and then we'll have a, a response to that talk by a youth panel and then uh, we'll have a, a second talk and then we'll conclude with, a, uh, with all the speakers and participants and uh, uh, being able, you'll be able to ask questions uh, via Zoom and engage us. So this will be presented on YouTube and then at the end we'll have a live uh, Zoom uh, interaction, question and answer. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, with the introduction of our first uh, uh, speaker, and that is um, Wayne Suenaga, and uh, he, the title of his talk is Climate Change, Fossil Fuels, and a Buddhist View. And he wrote to me and said, now make sure that you emphasize this is a Buddhist rule, uh, a Buddhist view, uh, means emphasis on A, as in one, my own personal, uh, definitely a layman's point of view. But uh, Wayne is a longtime student of Buddhism, and uh, he was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, where he gained an appreciation for nature and natural processes uh, such as waves and volcanoes and an awareness of ecology. A notion in the early 1960s of recycling had him gathering cans and bottles to put into uh, small collection bins at temporary sites on school campuses. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Earth Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a, a Master's in Science and a PhD in Geology and Geophysics at the University of Hawaii. A grad assistantship with the uh, University of Hawaii geothermal exploration effort led to a job in a small geothermal group at Atlantic Richfield uh, Company during the aftermath of the 1970s energy crisis. He and his wife continued recycling, this time taking it to permanent sites with large bins, but still requiring a manual separation of recycled material. As the energy crisis subsided, the geothermal group ended, and he spent the rest of his career in oil and gas exploration, including a six-year assignment in Jakarta, Indonesia. Now living in Kirkland, Washington, he learned about and became a Buddhist through the Shambhala organization, a Tibetan Buddhist organization, and is now a member of the Seattle Betsuin Buddhist Temple. That's this temple here. Uh, Also, uh, next I want to introduce our other uh, main speaker, and that is uh, Dr. Jason Wirth. And uh, I should have said Dr. Wayne Zuenaga too when I, when I uh, introduced him. Uh, Dr. Jason Wirth is a professor, or the title of his talk is uh, Gr uh, Gross Earth Happiness. So you've probably heard of Bhutan and the Gross uh, National Happiness. Uh, well, this is uh, the title of his talk is Gross, Gross Earth Happiness. Dr. Jason Wirth is a professor of philosophy at Seattle University, just down the road from here. Um, his recent books include 
at Nietzsche and other Buddhas, philosophy after comparative philosophy. Um, and mountains, rivers, and the great earth, reading Gary Snyder and Dogen in an age of ecological crisis. And the co-edited volume, Japanese and Continental Philosophy, Conversations with the Kyoto School. He is currently completing a work of ecological philosophy called Turtle Island Anarchy. He is an ordained priest in the Soto Zen tradition and director of the Seattle University Eko Sangha um, and student of the Yabunochi School of Tea Ceremony. Um, I, of all the um, Eko Sanghas that have been founded in uh, various temples, um, most of them, well, all of them, except for Jason's Eko Sangha, uh, are based in uh, Jodo Shinshu temples within the Buddhist churches of America. And uh, Jason uh, started the, uh, I met with him, and, and uh, he really liked the idea of the Eko Sangha. They were already doing that uh, before we met, but we, um, he, he liked the term and uh, what we had done. So uh, they started an Eko Sangha at uh, Seattle University uh, quite a number of years ago now. And uh, just as I think San Jose's Eko Sangha is very, very active. And I was so delighted several years ago to be invited to speak to them on their 10th anniversary of the founding of a uh, uh, really dynamic and active uh, organization within their temple. So. Uh, Jason and I uh, became very good friends and we practiced tea ceremony together. Uh, he says um, that we are masters of Kyogen. And if you're familiar with the term, Japanese term Kyogen, it refers to a certain farcical drama. And um, uh, sometimes we make wonderful and delightful and very humorous mistakes at our tea ceremony practice. We're, uh, during the pandemic, we're still continuing to practice tea, but it's via Zoom. We may be the only group, uh, that uh, tea, tea ceremony group, that is able to practice via Zoom, uh, thanks to uh, modern technology. Uh, so today, I hope that uh, this seminar is very meaningful for you and very uh, inspiring uh, that it will uh, be a great motivation to think about starting an Eko Sangha uh, at your temple or getting involved in an Eko Sangha that already exists at your temple and how you can implement some of the insights that you gain from today's seminar into your daily life. Um, my koan you might say, my Eko Sangha koan is uh, when you have something in your hand and you're about to discard it, ask yourself, where did it come from and where is it going? And you'll find that that is a profound, universal cosmic ecology question. So. Well, again, thank you for, um, for uh, viewing today, and um, we'll get started with our program immediately. Thank you. Naman Davidson, Naman Naman Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you, Reverend Castro, for your introduction. You know, and thank you for your commitment over the years to ecology, and not just commitment, but action in setting up Echo Sangha and encouraging these annual Earth Day events. Now, the first term in the title of my talk is climate change, and that reflects our common interests, yours, mine, and that of the audience here. The second term, fossil fuels, brings in my background, training in ge geology and physics, and my work experience as an exploration geophysicist first in geothermal and then in oil and gas. Now th the third term, a Buddhist view, with the emphasis on a view, which is my own and, which, and is definitely one of a layman. So let's get started. 
I'm here at the Zoom and Windows control panel. This is a talk on climate change. Over the years, I've been to many talks on this topic and they have all been depressing, describing immense problems against seemingly inadequate proposals to conquer them. My goal here is not to make a depressing presentation, but without trivializing anything. I think with a clear view of the science of, of, the science of climate change and with lessons from a Buddhist teaching, we can reach, if not a fully optimistic, at least a saner way forward. Climate change is a great problem of our times, and it is a threat to our way of life, but it is not caused by something that is uncontrollable, like a large meteorite or super volcanoes. The cause of climate change can be controlled by us humans, mainly because it was generated by us. In my talk today, I'll briefly go over the science of climate change, the reasoning behind its cause and its solution. The evidence is strong, the reasoning is straightforward, and the solution seems logical and simple. But a huge question arises. Why is the implementation of the solution so difficult? We'll consider a couple of views on this, including a Buddhist teaching that I just mentioned. Now, simply put, climate change is a physical phenomenon heating the earth, starting in the atmosphere. In the early days, maybe 50 to 100 years ago, this topic was of academic interest with even a cause for it being proposed. When it was realized that it was going to be a big problem, in 1988, the United Nations organized a group to study climate change and to recommend ways to, to combat it. The group is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change. Every few years, the IPCC issues summaries of the science of climate change and comes up with conclusions. Now, as you can imagine, these reports are long and complex. The most recent major report was 1,500 pages. There are summaries, pretty good ones, of the report in science journals, Wikipedia, and others. There are also articles and commentaries in more popular journals, usually with a slant to their agenda and sometimes verging onto the sensational and extreme, but more on this in a, little, in, a, in a bit. To get the most accurate view of climate change, you need to go to the science studies as summarized in the IPCC report. To save you some time, here is a brief summary. And not only that, climate change in about eight words. Now there's a lot wrapped up into these words. Here's an expanded summary. It's going on now. This is undeniable. Worldwide average air and land temperatures are steadily increasing more than one degree centigrade so far. And you'll see some evidence shortly. Now, everything is getting hot. It starts in the atmosphere, warms things on the surface, and goes into the ocean. Now, that's how heat works. It's basic physics. For the atmosphere, the added heat releases more energy and warmer air holds more water, which shows up in bigger storms. So what was once a category two hurricane is now a category four or five. There are change in seasons. Typhoons in Japan used to end in September. Now they're coming ashore in October similar to the east and gulf coast of the US. There's also a change in seasons and growing seasons all over the world. For land, it's longer droughts, bigger fires, like uh, in Australia, Russia, and California last year, and rapid melting of glaciers, and now even permafrost. Heat even sneaks into the ocean, which causes thermal expansion, which adds to sea level rise. There is also acidification, killing off coral reefs and even the oysters in Wallapa Bay. And it's going to get hotter. The cause of heating has risen quickly, but will dissipate slowly. So the effects will continue for a long time. Now, you know much of this because it is the content of the daily news. But daily news includes things that exaggerate and catastrophize even. 
Here are a few examples. Seven ways you can help save the planet right now. It's now or never. Climate change will be sudden and cataclysmic. We need to act fast. 12 years to save the planet. And humanity is getting very close to extinction. It's pretty much over for humans. Are these points in the IPCC reports? No, they are not. So this is what climate change is not. The planet Earth does not need saving. It'll go on quite well. It's not mentioned any, anywhere in the IPCC reports. Besides, consider the geologic history of the Earth. I mentioned meteors and uh, volcanoes earlier. Well, the Earth has been hit by large meteors, like the one that led to the end of the dinosaurs. There have been long periods of extreme volcanism, which caused huge changes in the temperature and even the composition of the atmosphere. There have been times that have been very hot and very cold. The prospective temperature increases caused by climate change are nowhere near those events. The earth will go on quite well. Humanity won't go extinct. A search for the word extinct or even extinction in the reports refers only to the possible extinction of other species. You know, basically we're the cause of extinctions, but this has been going on for a long time since humans have come onto the scene. Now, the fact that we aren't going to be extinct, it shouldn't make you feel better because the extinction of other species is not a good thing. Now, the point I wanna make here on this page is that climate change is not an annihilation type of event. Leave that to the movies. Now, some of the headlines and articles like these are written for uh, clickbait, but others are written by well-meaning people who think they have to scare you into action. Well, that may be so, but the deluge of these articles over time is causing real stress and despair and real suffering. Climate anxiety is now a field of study. So if you or someone you know is suffering from this, perhaps these points can relieve some of your concerns. You know, on the other hand, I don't want to overplay this point either because it doesn't diminish the real dangers and problems that climate change brings. It is a great challenge and we can do something about it, but it is hard enough to concentrate on what needs to be done if you constantly hear or read that it is going to be the end of everything. Uh, maybe the lesson here is to be selective in your sources of information. The science says this, the primary cause of climate change is the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. In brief, burning fossil fuel releases carbon dioxide, CO2, into the atmosphere. The CO2 interacts with the sun's energy, which would normally be reflected back into outer space in a way that traps heat in the atmosphere. This is the greenhouse effect. Now there is a way for the earth to recycle carbon. This is how the carbon cycle looked before we started burning fossil fuels. Humans and animals breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2. Plants take in CO2 and convert it to their needs. When all living things die, they either decompose and go back to the environment or are preserved as carbonized fossils and under the right conditions, converted to fossil fuels. There was a balance in the amount of carbon in the cycle for a long time. For thousands of years, the CO2 in the atmosphere as measured in ice cores from glaciers was more or less steady at 280 to 300 parts per million. Now enter the industrial age, starting with coal-fired steam engines and oil and gas powered engines of all type. The burning of fossil fuels releases a lot of energy, but also releases all its carbon as CO2. As more and more fossil fuels are burned, it has basically overwhelmed the Earth's carbon recycling capability. The amount of fossil fuel burned to support modern industrial society is many times that 
of what is produced directly by living things. Now, the question is, is that so? Where the heck did all these fossil fuels come from in the first place? And is there that much in the air? Well, there is. And here is something that can help you understand it more on a uh, gut level. The graph at the bottom was made about 15 years ago. The topic at that time was peak oil when it was thought that the world was reaching the peak of oil production. Time is along the bottom from the end of World War II until now, basically covering the lifespans of uh, all of us. World, War, uh, world oil production is the red curve. When you see a curve like this that seems to be peaking, it means that about half of the oil in the ground has already been produced. Now the yellow curve is the CO2 in the atmosphere from a base of about 300, it is now over 400. For earth processes, this is a huge change in just a short time. In fact, it's a very short time, microscopically short, considering how long it took for the earth to generate this oil. Look at the figure at the top. It is a very schematic graph of the formation of oil. It goes back in time to when there was abundant life on Earth. In this case, about 500 million years ago. The oldest coal and oil date back to near then. The Earth has slowly produced these carbon fuel, carbon deposits from time to time over the last 500 million years. Now this is kalpa length time and it's hard to conceive. The time represented by the top graph is 10 million times the length of the lower graph. It took all that time to produce and preserve this oil and we have burned up much of it in our lifetime, dumping all that carbon into the atmosphere. No wonder there's climate change. In fact, it would be surprising if this huge amount of carbon didn't have any effect. So it is entirely reasonable to conclude that the burning of fossil fuel is the cause of climate change. And this is the consequence. The increase in temperature as shown here. The, the worldwide average annual temperature is shown by the bars, the blue and the red bars above and below the average for the entire century. So it prog progresses from cooler than the baseline to accelerating in our lifetime to more than one degree centigrade. In fact, look how it matches the CO2 increase. Now, there are still people around who claim that every cold snap, like the one in Texas in February, proves there is no warming. The lower graph is an explanation for this. Now, the actual daily temperature in any one place over one year ranges from very cold to very hot and the average is near the peak of the curve. So when the average temperature uh, increases, basically what happens is that the whole curve moves to the hot side. This explains an increase in number and severity of hot events, but it doesn't eliminate the cold events. And so there will be uh, still cold snaps uh, in any one area. Well, we have found the cause of climate change, the burning of fossil fuels. From there, the solution is simple. Stop burning fossil fuels. You know, as the activists say, keep it in the ground, no mining or drilling. Basically, leave everything there. And basically, you know, that's the right idea. So with the solution in hand and to get things done, the UN moved from science to politics. This started with the Earth Summit in Rio, in 1992. In later meetings in Kyoto and in Paris, countries realized the problem and committed to policies that would radically reduce fossil fuel consumption. Then they went back home with their commitments and the response was, you promised what? Pushback was from everywhere, from established businesses, but also from workers. Remember the yellow vest movement in France a few years ago? Part of the reason for the protests was the increase in gas and diesel prices. Farmers and working people thought they were bearing the brunt of a commitment to decrease oil use. 
So the simple theory was that every country would do its share. In practice though, every country is way behind their commitment. And this brings us to the key question of the whole matter of climate change. Why is stopping the burning of fossil fuels so hard? Okay, let's stand back and look at two perspectives on this. The first one is, why are we burning so much in the first place? Well, basically it has been and is the prime energy source of our industrial society. Think of all the material benefits of modern society. Transportation is obvious, but it also supports industrial agriculture, a spread out suburban lifestyle, and a globalized economy. There are all the advances in technology, medical care, pharmaceuticals, computing, and education. And there's the fun part too, entertainment, sports, and vacation travel. And not all fossil fuels are burned for energy. Some of it is turned into plastics, which is slowly engulfing all of us. All of these are components of our modern society. Now here's something to consider. We just saw how long it took for the earth to generate fossil fuels. Perhaps we can think of fossil fuels as a gift of the earth that helped build all this. But we are now at a turning point. The gift has become a curse the destruction and pain caused by climate change puts at risk what has already been built. And it really makes sense to stop. There is a problem though with stopping too fast or without considering the consequences of stopping. For instance, the response to COVID-19 was necessary with lockdowns and quarantines, but look at all the problems and suffering that it caused by stopping acti activity quickly. But there is something more. Perhaps we have gotten so used to the comforts of this life that we don't even think of them as comforts and it has been built into our expect expectations. Now, this is one view. Here's a second view. Climate change in a framework of the four noble truths. Now, I'm not claiming equivalence. The Four Noble Truths, their ultimate truth, Dharma, good for all time and all circumstances. Climate change is just a huge problem of our age. You know, it will be resolved one way or another. The first noble truth, the existence of suffering. It's a universal condition. For climate change, those suffering are the victims of all the storms and events and maybe we should also include those stressed out by our climate anxiety. The second noble truth, the cause of suffering. Well, what we learn in temple is that it's our worldly passions, greed, anger, stupidity, or ignorance, basically our attachments to what we think is our solid ego. For climate change, it, it is the burning of fossil fuels, but isn't that due to our attachments both individually and as a whole society? The third noble truth, cessation of suffering. Well, it looks like we have to abandon or at least control our passions. For climate change is to stop burning fossil fuels, which means controlling our attachments as we develop other ways of powering our life. Now, stop here. Isn't this the hard part? I mean, these truths seem reasonable, at least on an intellectual level. The third too seems reasonable, but abandoning or reducing our passions in real life, well, we're just back to what we just went through in the first uh, look at this about the difficulty of stopping. The fourth noble truth is the path to liberation, the action plan, the eightfold path, right view, right thought, right speech, and so on. You know, no specific actions are given. It is left to each person based on our understanding of the Dharma, the lessons of wisdom, compassion, and gratitude that form the basis for specific choices we make in life. Is there an equivalent for climate change? You know, there are a lot of ways to take action in, in, in response to climate change. Many of us are already doing some of them or are considering doing others. What can we use as guides in choosing what to do? What about using the same lessons? 
you know, we're Jodo Buddhas. And start with gratitude, represented by Amida Buddha. But you say, hey, this is a crisis. What do we have to be thankful for? Well, how about gratitude to the earth for leaving us the gift of fossil fuel as an energy source that helped create some of the good things in our life? It's a gift that is now past its due date and dealing with it is our challenge. Also gratitude for being the earth as a place to find comfort. With all the attention to violent storms and the turmoil they create, for much of the time, nature provides peace and tranquility, like springtime in the mountains or along the seashore. In essence, every day is Earth Day. Now look at the picture of the calm ocean shore. And this is my oil exploration background talking. You know, some of the largest oil fields started out in settings like this. Large, shallow oceans full of plankton, millions and millions of tons of them living and then dying and sinking to the bottom. Then buried deep enough in the earth, thousands of feet to be cooked and converted to oil. Without the earth being host to abundant life and without the dynamic earth processes, there would be no oil or fossil fuels to worry about. You know, but if the earth was not such a nice and active planet, there might not have been the conditions for humans to exist either. You know, we have a lot to be grateful for. And remember, Buddha called on the earth as a witness to his enlightenment. There is wisdom represented by Manjushri. Now we have all already used some of our wisdom to get a little clearer view of our worldly situation, seeing the gift of fossil fuels that turned out to be a curse. Wisdom can mean, you know, looking at a larger view. And when I do this, if, if climate change were the only problem we face, I would be more optimistic. However, there are other huge problems confronting us that we have to handle at the same time. Extreme political pol polarization, growing economic inequality, racial divides. And we see how these things hampered the response to the pandemic. Now, many of the actions to reduce fossil fuels will generate honest differences. We will have to appeal to our wisdom to help reduce and resolve these conflicts. You know, we could make a contribution as peacemakers and negotiators. In a slightly broader view, we could also apply wisdom to learn to live a better, simpler life using less energy. I feel Buddhists and followers of other religions should be the leaders in this effort. You know, after all, don't we have a vision of what a good life means? And finally, how about compassion? represented by Kanan. There will be many victims of climate change and not just humans. Wherever we can help should be a priority. I suppose we could go on, but let's stop for now and summarize. Climate change is a threat to our way of life. It does not seem to be an existential problem in my opinion. The cause is the burning of fossil fuels and stopping it is the solution. But stopping will not be easy because of the immense amount of inertia and resistance to needed change in our way of life and the structure of society. And the next point builds on that. We should be ready to participate and lead in the changes needed. And finally, the framework of the four noble truths can help us understand that the difficulty in stopping the use of fossil fuels lies in our human nature and attachments. With the lessons of the fourth noble truth, we should face climate change in the same manner we face other things in life, with action based not on fear or despair, but with wisdom, compassion, and gratitude. Well, that's it. Now, some of this or much of it may have been a review for you, but I think I put in a few points that could generate some good conversation. And I really would like to hear what you think. But for now, thank you for listening. Thank you, Wayne. And hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. 
My name is Josh McKinney, and I'm a member of the Seattle Betsween Buddhist Temple, as well as a student at Western Washington University. Wayne reached out to the members of the Seattle Betsween Senior YBA to see if we'd be willing to share a bit of our perspective on climate change as young people. And that's why I'm here today. The four of us are going to briefly talk about different aspects of climate change that we consider important. For my part, I'm going to talk about climate anxiety. My goal for today's presentation is to introduce the idea of climate anxiety to people who are new to the term and to hopefully provide some action steps and comfort to people who currently feel climate anxiety. Climate anxiety, as described by the American Psychological Association, is a chronic fear of environmental doom, and research into it is fairly new. Other terms that have a similar meaning are climate grief, ecological anxiety, and eco-distress. As Wayne said during his presentation, climate anxiety has become its own field of study. Scientists have become fully aware of how many people feel climate anxiety and how these feelings impact people's actions towards environmental care. According to researchers at Yale University and George Mason University, over the past five years, the number of Americans who are very worried about climate change has more than doubled to 26%. In 2020, an American Psychiatric Association poll found that more than half of Americans are concerned about climate change's effect on their mental health, according to the New York Times. That's half of all people in the U.S. whose mental health is negatively affected by the climate crisis, and that's just in America. In places outside of the U.S., where people's lives are being uprooted by the effects of climate change, climate anxiety and grief is an even greater issue. Now that I've introduced what climate anxiety is and its relevance, I want to talk about what we can do to make it go away. First off, I think the most important thing we can do is to normalize the idea of climate anxiety. Anyone who has these concerns should feel comfortable talking about how they feel. One of the best ways to reduce feelings of anxiety is to talk to other people about it. That could be forming a support group to talk to other people who feel the same way as you, or just talking to those close to you about the concerns you're feeling. Another thing that psychologists recommend is going out into nature. Going out into nature reminds us of why we care so much about the planet in the first place. And it's also good for our mental health. The other thing people can do is doing their part to minimize their carbon footprint. I know that we're all just individuals and our actions are microscopic in the grand scheme of things, but that doesn't mean they're meaningless. We're all connected and even little actions like minimizing the electricity use add up to make a positive impact on the world. As just, and just as importantly, these actions can be empowering to the individual. It feels good to know that you're taking action on an issue you care about, even if it's only by doing small things. If you feel good about yourself when you're being environmentally conscious, that's reason alone enough to keep it up. Lastly, I just want to say feeling climate anxiety or not feeling climate anxiety, neither way is wrong. If you have climate anxiety, it means you care about the environment a lot, and that's awesome. And if you don't have climate anxiety, that doesn't mean you don't care. It just means climate change hasn't negatively impacted your mental health as much as it has for other people, which is a good thing. I just want people who have climate grief to be free of their suffering, and people who don't have climate grief to know a little more about it as a feeling people feel. Thank you for listening. I'm now going to hand the mic over to Emily Coe, who's going to be talking about racial injustice and climate change. Thank you, Josh, for the introduction into climate grief. Hi, my name is Emily Ko, and I use the pronouns she, they, and I'm going to be talking about roots of racism in climate change. I first would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe, people that are still here continuing to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. Let's talk about race. Although race is a social construct, racism is very real and has played a very large role in U.S. policy since the beginning of the start of the U.S. Um, we cannot talk about climate change without addressing the disproportionate effects on Black communities and people of color. The U.S. has a history of creating racist policy that subjugates Black and Brown communities to exposure of toxic and unhealthy environments and unequal protection and reconstruction efforts and natural disasters. As a quick disclaimer, I am very well aware that the history of environmental justice is extremely complex and includes many issues throughout time and geographic location that I cannot include in these three minutes that I have with you. 
I am so honored for the time that I do have with you, and I hope I will provide an introduction to policies and organizations and research dedicated to environmental justice for you to further, for you to further explore on your own. I next would like to talk about racial hierarchies in the US. In 1934, the Federal Housing Policy Act was established that actively and intentionally contributed to segregation. This resulted in redlining from overtly racist categories that channeled almost all of the loan money towards whites and away from communities of color. Minority communities were housed in neighborhoods that were deemed as hazardous due to being near power plants or industrial areas that release pollutants. Black and Hispanic communities are often exposed to more air pollutants because of the longer driving distances compared to white Americans. And this has very much impacted life expectancy of black and Hispanic communities that is much lower than white, than the white population. The US also displays racial hierarchies in the way that the federal government pri prioritizes corporations. History has often included pipelines that segregate and damage tribal and native lands, such as the Keystone Pipeline XL that ran from Alaska to um, Texas. Also from the Great New Deal, highways have been created that separate and damage black, and pe black communities and people of color. This is all from, all stems from white supremacy that prioritizes white feelings over minorities. One may ask themselves, why is, white, why is money making infrastructures not being built through white communities? Why is money being invested to lessen the damage of highways on wealthy, wealthy communities? Often the answer is, we don't want to hurt the people that are paying the most money, which happens to be white communities. Natural disasters also disproportionately affect communities of color. A majority of communities that are impacted um, from natural disasters are black and brown communities, and many are still recovering with less federal aid than they need to reestablish themselves. For example, Hurricane Katrina, the victims of Hurricane Katrina are still trying to recover. This brings to light how many communities of color are vulnerable, vulnerable to flooding, heat, snow, and etc. This was seen in Texas of this year when many communities of color were left without power, heat, and water for more than two weeks and months time. Well, what can we do? One, don't be too harsh on yourself and remember what Josh was talking about, climate grief. Grow awareness by attending events like this one, um, sign petitions, follow organizations on social media, and if you're able to financially support organizations that are committed to environmental and racial justice, such as the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Finally, reflecting on your own experiences and identity can help create, gain a larger perspective on how you can um, individually um, support people and communities of color. Here are my resources. Hello everyone, this is Emi Nakashima from the Seattle Betsuin Buddhist Temple. And today I'm going to talk about fast fashion as a part of uh, Eco Sangha. So what is fast fashion? Uh, fast fashion is the concept that uh, companies are producing clothing and fashion products uh, very quickly and for a low price with using low quality materials in order to get um, fashion seen on the catwalk uh, out into the public as fast as possible. So uh, why is this bad for the environment? Um, the first reason is that there are a lot of clothes and resources uh, wasted um, due to the fact that factors are producing so much extra clothing in order to, de to meet popular demand. Um, due to the large excess of clothing um, that is like not bought, for example, or, or that is bought and not worn very much. Um, every year, 85% of clothing uh, is thrown away. Part of this is also that customers these days are buying more clothing um, and wearing them for a shorter amount of time. So each 
individual piece of clothing is being used less. Uh, another factor uh, that affects the environment is um, water, uh, how much water is used in order to make clothing. The fashion industry um, is the second highest consumer of water in the world um, because uh, mostly due to the fact that cotton production requires a lot of water. Um, next is water pollution. Um, the fashion industry is responsible for 20% of the world's uh, industry caused water pollution. Um, this is mostly because toxic dyes um, used for clothing, uh, used to dye clothing are released into the public waterways and rivers uh, and pollute those areas. Um, another source of pollution is actually washing clothes in the washing machine. Um, this releases quite a, a bit of plastic um, into the ocean, most of which is polyester, uh, which does not break down easily. Um, the uh, amount of plastic released into the ocean is equivalent to uh, 500 million plastic bottles. Uh, and last but not least is CO2 uh, emissions. The fashion industry um, produces 10% uh, of the world's carbon dioxide emissions, which is um, more than the carbon footprint of international air and maritime travel combined. So what can we do uh, to help counter the effects of fast fashion? Um, there, there are quite a few things that you can actually do yourself. Uh, one is to buy less clothing. So think more consciously about, oh, do I actually need this piece of clothing when you're going shopping? A second is checking the quality of the clothing. So try to buy sustainable or high quality or clothes made with sustainable or high quality materials. Um, third is to buy from sustainable brands or secondhand stores. Uh, third is to rent clothing, especially if it's um, going to be for a special occasion where you're only wearing the clothes once. Um, and last is repurposing or redesigning clothing. Um, so if there's something that went out of style, you could maybe use that another way. Um, and there are lots of other ways that you can also um, help. Okay, and I just wanted to introduce you to a few uh, brands that are fas fast fashion brands um, that are pretty well known. And here are some sustainable brands that you may also know. So. Um, feel free to look into this more if you're interested. Here are some resources that I used. Um, so if you're interested in fast fashion, please feel free to take a look. I think these will be sent out um, after. And thank you for listening. Um, I mostly just wanted to raise awareness about fast fashion today. Um, and so I'm not saying that you should not buy from some of the brands. That I mentioned, I just wanted you to be more aware about what is actually happening and to try to consciously think about um, the clothes you're buying and wearing. Uh, so next up, I think is uh, Koki talking about uh, climate justice. So thank you for listening, and please enjoy the rest of Eco Sangha. Hi everyone, my name is Koki. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a member of Hompa Honganji Hawaii Betsuin Temple. I'm also a member of the Young Buddhist Editorial, and I grew up going to Seattle Betsuin, um, and I studied environmental science um, in undergrad. So I feel really lucky to have had the invitation to join in this discussion on um, climate change, especially how it relates to Buddhism. And um, I feel lucky to have been able to talk with Josh and Emmy and Emily about some of the topics we'd like to cover um, when thinking about what youth are thinking about with climate change. So metacognition there, I guess. But um, after these, their presentations, which I think all did a great job of covering different angles of how climate change affects different aspects of our life, I wanted to focus this brief section on climate justice, which as somebody who's spent some time thinking about climate change and environmental science through school um, and also after graduating, I think that this has been a big way to find hope in the climate change um, fight against climate change as well as in the conservation movement. Um, and it's a hopeful note that I, I would hope um, 
to leave people with after, after this fruitful discussion today. Um, another thing I should mention is I don't feel qualified to cover the topic of climate justice. I don't think, um, I don't think anyone could do it justice in, in just four minutes, but I especially have to, um, you know, say that I rely on a lot of resources, many of which are cited here, and I don't think that I'm the best equipped to talk about it because it is such an important issue. Um, but for those same reasons and its importance, I wanted to um, ensure that it was included. Um, and so I appreciate having the space to talk a little bit more about it. So briefly, um, when you think about climate change, uh, this is just a quick brainstorm that I did um, at the start of the invitation to talk here. You know, so many things are connected to our climate and our environment. And climate change isn't just an environmentalist issue, it's an issue of our economy, our social structures, so much more. Um, you know, everything that Josh touched on, it's a personal thing. Emmy talking about corporations and Emily, of course, talking about racial hierarchies and the way those contribute to um, unequal impacts. So there's so many things that touch climate change. And so expanding our understanding of what climate means and what environmental work means, I think to me really allowed more people to be called into the conversation than those who might um, initially identify with the conservation movement. So looking toward climate justice, um, and this definition was kind of compiled from a few different sources, but it's recognizing that the impacts of climate change are not equitably distributed, and instead they exacerbate existing systems of power and inequality. But really want to focus on what enacting climate justice looks like. That's the kind of visionary leadership that I um, have seen with um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of young activists. There's so many examples of people who are really moving forward um, and bringing climate justice to the forefront of conversations through um, so many different lenses, you know, immigration, economic justice, job empowerment, um, dismantling systems of racist systems and systems of oppression. But it'll re it require that we integrate human rights into climate solutions and that those communities who are most impacted, like black, brown, indigenous communities who have been impacted by climate change already are the leaders in the conversation about how to integrate human rights into our climate solutions. So what could that look like? Um, it could be part of the land back movement. So giving indigenous groups sovereignty to make their own decisions about their land. Um, it could mean providing extra job training as we transition to renewable energies. It could mean um, within the policy sphere, preventing big polluters from having factories put anywhere rather than um, like Emily discussed, having those just go in low income neighborhoods where it might be affordable to place a factory. And it could even be a voting rights issue. So ensuring that people of color and low income communities have increased access to voting. Um, if they so choose to express um, their right to democracy in that way. So two short connections that I like to draw to Buddhism, and these could definitely be enhanced by more conversations with those who have spent more time studying Buddhism than I have. Um, but with interconnectedness, we all play into a system of consumerism and consumption and also larger organizations and corporations and systems of uh, power play in, in with one another to create this wicked problem as some call climate change. But looking forward to how we enact climate justice, um, we can see climate action as compassion in action. And if those solutions are guided by a framework of compassion, I think we have a really strong chance of moving forward to creating a more just and equitable future. So super brief and a lot to cover, but if anyone's curious about more climate justice resources or how to build a ho hopeful future for our climate, um, these are some things uh, that have really inspired me. So I'll make sure that they're available to anyone via text as well. Um, really wanna thank everyone for the opportunity to join today. Um, and I appreciate this conversation occurring um, in so many different spaces, especially in the temple community. So big thank you.
Greetings, everyone. Thank you for being here and for um, letting me share a few thoughts with you from a Buddhist perspective uh, during uh, Earth Day period. It's been said many, many times that Earth Day, of course, the problem with Earth Day is that it's just a day. But the idea of the Earth is every day we have an Earth, every day we have everything that the Earth gives us, including our lives, including us being here right now. But anyway, happy Earth Day, everyone. It's a very important day in general for all humans. And I think it also has some very special uh, importance for those of us um, like us gathered today who endeavor to negotiate the Buddha way. So I've prepared a few thoughts for you um, to go along with the thoughts shared with uh, Wayne and with Reverend Castro, uh, two very excellent presentations that I'm very happy and humbled to include mine among them. So thank you for listening. And I look forward also to the possibility of answering your questions uh, later on Zoom. I begin this Earth Day with a simple, I think in some ways very obvious observation, although it's interesting that although it's so simple and so obvious, we don't always think it all the way through or really even give it that much thought at all. And that observation is this. We are part of an ecology. So if you were to take the ecological conditions away, there would be no water for us to drink, no air for us to breathe, no materials for our shelters and our classrooms. Um, we would be in big trouble. We would not be at all. And we are part of an economy. The economy uh, makes it possible for little pieces of paper to mean something like money. It provides markets, it provides jobs. Uh, it organizes our lives socially, our shared lives together uh, in very fundamental ways. Both are not going so well these days. And one may be at the heart of why the other is not going so well these days. It's not news to anyone that the reason why we celebrate Earth Day is not because we love the Earth that much and we just feel like, well, let's have one day a year that we set aside for the Earth to have a birthday or a we appreciate you Earth Day. It was born out of a rising awareness of ecological crisis, a crisis I might add that has gotten much worse since the first Earth Day 51 years ago. Um, Wayne, of course, uh, has given you a, a very tempered but also sobering account of what this crisis looks like. Uh, and we can also say from an ethical point of view, the ecological crisis is showing us that we have very poor commitment to transgenerational justice. What is transgenerational justice? We did not invent our language. Each person does not invent the economy for themselves. Most people did not build their own houses or teach themselves in their own schools. All these things come to us. The whole world, the whole human world as we know it comes to us as the result of the hard work and generosity and sacrifices of our ancestors. It was often said in this country that we should leave behind a world that is better for our children than the world that we found when we were children. But the ecological crisis is revealing this. For us in this present generation to enjoy 
the way of life that we do, it will become increasingly difficult for future generations to imagine such a life for themselves. What kind of world are we leaving future generations when our cities are fighting off constant flooding and being underwater, when our agriculture uh, is in crisis because of changing patterns in the climate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the economic order, the second part, does not seem to be going so well either. This is not World Economy Day, it's Earth Day, but I can just say in passing, economically, we are looking at the ravages of great global inequality and inequity. If economics is in part the kind of human behavior that is making this uh, generation of human beings or this era or epoch of human beings, the Anthropocene, so a time in which what it is to be human has unprecedented impact on the earth, it's important to know that the result of that was not that at least everyone was living well in the present economy. Future generations, oh well, good luck. At least we've got ours. Some live better than other. Some enjoy unprecedented wealth and advantage and leisure and luxury, and others still scrape by, barely making it, working in difficult and painful economic circumstances. What is at the root of this interlocking crisis? complex set of answers. There's scientific answers, there's economic answers, there's philosophical answers, and I'm just going to share with you some Buddhist reflections on some part of that. Economics as we currently practice it has as its primary driver growth. But it does not ask we might note, towards what are we growing? We have growth for the sake of growth. Growth growing towards more growth, which grows towards more growth, which grows towards more growth. Every limit of growth is not a limit, but a battle line, not a boundary, but an opportunity to see, can we break through that limit of growth? Growth for its own sake, growth that must grow, even if it grows into a world in which the economy as we know it is no longer possible because life as we know it is no longer sustainable or all that attractive or not beset by great crisis. You know, one of the most important founding works, I'm sure some of you know this, about how we think about economics today, the global capitalist order, was found in a man named Adam Smith in the late 18th century. And Adam Smith certainly did not believe in what he called the vile maxim. The vile maxim is, a few people would say, everything for me. He thought that was a huge problem. He thought it was a danger inherent in the economic system that he saw developing already uh, in the late 18th century. But he did think that the best way to motivate participation at some level in economics as we know it was not benevolence. Not that we would enter this so that we can help others and ourselves as another. Not that we would lift all boats up together, 
with our shared activity and our shared sacrifice, but rather each person would perceive that they get their own. They get their own piece of the pie. I've got mine, good luck getting yours. I read the very famous passage from Adam Smith. It is not from benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. Self-love is an old fashioned kind of old timey way of saying what we would say now, selfishness. To their self-love and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Nobody but a beggar chooses to depend chiefly upon the benevolence of their fellow citizens. A sucker assumes that we would take care of each other. A sucker assumes that in a dog eat dog world, the big dogs are willing to share all that they have taken. Well, despite all the advantages uh, of an economy in which people participate at an unprecedented level, and it certainly has elevated uh, standards of living for many, many people, uh, not equally, maybe not equitably, maybe not justly, but standards of living are better. We have an unprecedented number of people on the earth right now. Uh, so I don't want to say that uh, this has had no benefits. But we have to ask ourselves, can we continue to solve the ecological crisis and the ways of human living that drive the earth into that crisis by just addressing the symptoms of how we live and not going to the root? What is the root cause? Now, since I'm speaking to people who, like myself, try to negotiate the Buddha way, um, going to the root, this is at the heart of our practice. Not merely shuffling around symptoms, but trying to get to the root of why we have the symptoms that we do. We must attend to this route. So two years after the first Earth Day, uh, a book that still read very carefully today came out, a little classic by a man named E.F. Schumacher. And he called it, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered. That's a novel idea. I thought economics was because people mattered. He wrote a book of Buddhist economics and the Buddhist perspective would say, our economics should be practiced for the sake of people first and foremost. And I might add a friendly amendment to uh, Mr. Schumacher, but I think an even better Buddhist title for the book could have been economics as if all life mattered economics as if the earth and all her creatures mattered. But nonetheless, Schumacher gave a very powerful analysis of this route that I'm trying to get to. Schumacher writes and argues that the modern global economy is fundamentally, and now in his words, a frenzy of greed and indulges in an orgy of envy and these are not accidental features, but the very causes of its expansionist success. So A, its success is that it continues to get bigger and bigger. The growth that seeks to grow successfully finds ways against all odds and against seeming limitations to keep on growing no matter what. 
From the Buddha's path, you'll remember that the Buddha himself said at the heart of our dukkha, the heart of our life out of balance and our dis-ease, at the heart of our suffering, were three poisons. Our inability to see who we are and how our desire works, our ignorance. And as a result, our greed, more, 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 and our aggression to fight off everything that limits our access to what we want. Now, this was for the Buddha absolutely fundamental to any negotiation of the Buddha way. Self-love, selfishness, we could say, now with Schumacher, but also with the Buddha, given the opportunity. It's perfectly happy to grow into what even Adam Smith feared, the vile maximum, the vile maxim, pardon me. That is everything for me. Now we may cooperate to put some limits on that being true, although we're not doing a good job when four or five or six people have as much wealth as the bottom half of this country combined. But there's nothing in self-love that says, I will make room for you. I will make room for the earth. I will make room for those who are not immediately me and my own. In a way, we could say this. Self-love is on the spectrum in which is extreme, the vile maxim, everything for me is cultivating the preta, the Buddhist hungry ghost. You remember they had very thin necks and enormous appetites, but because their necks were so thin and they could not get much food down, they could not consume very effectively. So the more they ate, the hungrier they became. More was never enough. Small is beautiful, says Schumacher. But for the preta, for the hungry ghosts, for the dukkha of human desire, no matter how much I have, I always feel inadequate and think that I should have more. Or Schumacher attests to this in this, I think, quite interesting way. If greed were not the master of the modern human, ably assisted by envy, food is three poisons, how could it be that the frenzy of economism, so growth, 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 does not abate as higher standards of living are attained. And that it is precisely the richest societies which pursue their economic advantage with the greatest ruthlessness. Wow. I mean, maybe it wouldn't be a good thing, but I would understand more. But really poor country that cannot even feed adequately its citizens was somewhat ruthless trying to get some food. But the poorest country is in no way as ruthless as the richest countries, which pursue their interests no matter who they trample. Economism, growth for the sake of growth. There is no growth toward what? Because there is no growth toward what, just growth for the sake of growth. There's also no way to hold it accountable. If you're growing towards something, you can always ask yourself, how well am I doing towards getting where I'm going? If we aspire to a certain world, we can ask ourselves, what are the metrics by which we can measure our progress toward that world? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? What are our threats? What are our opportunities? 
growth is just how can we get rid of anything that stands in the way of growth? The Preta are at odds with an earth that shall be a good place to live for future generations. I think that has to be very alarming. The hungry ghosts that lurk within every human heart. It has to be very alarming for we as we take up the Buddha way. For Schumacher, this was a call towards what he called wisdom. We all know that the Buddha spoke of prajna, wisdom. And for Schumacher, and he says this in a way that really shows that this is in some way correctly titled, he called this his work a work of Buddhist economics. Wisdom can be read about in numerous publications, but it can be found only inside oneself. A wise person might have some ideas about what wisdom is, but having ideas about wisdom does not by itself make you wise. It has to be how your heart and mind at their root operate. To be able to find it, Schumacher continues, one has to first liberate oneself from such masters as greed and envy. If we don't do so, Schumacher warns us, humans are driven to build up a monster economy which destroys the world. Wow. So you might say this, the problem of economics is not just going to be solved by changing our economic policies. We have to first and foremost become the kinds of people who want our economy to be held accountable and for its goods to be distributed to all people and for those goods to be sustainable, uh, holding great promise transgenerationally. Uh, we might even say an economy that makes this an earth that is better for all of its inhabitants, not worse for the wear. And I would say this is not just a Buddhist idea. We're living in a world in which I think cooperation is going to be key if we're going to find a way. And therefore, I think it's a good idea for us to work with all traditions who reach their hands out to us and to find common ground. The common ground that we can find is the earth itself, the ground upon which we walk and live, breathe, drink, grow, dream, cry, sleep. This earth is our common ground. I look, for example, to the Catholic Pope Francis. Uh, his last two papal encyclicals, the first Laudato Si, uh, a, a reference to St. Francis, his namesake, uh, but a deep call to all people of the way, of all ways that there are to be spiritual, to work together. Or in his new encyclical, Fratetti Tutti, he writes the following. Everything then depends on our ability to see the need for a change of heart. This is what Christians call metanoia, conversion. A change of heart. I am not a preta. I wake up and say, wow, I have lived like a preta in a society of pretas. And this has been my dukkha. To see the need for a change of heart, attitudes, and lifestyles. Otherwise, political propaganda, the media, and the shapers of public opinion will continue to promote an individualistic and uncritical culture subservient to unregulated economic interests and societal institutions at the service of those 
who already enjoy too much power. For this, we would lose the earth. For this, we would lose the pure land towards which we aspire. Another way to look at this uh, would be to look at the small Buddhist country of Bhutan, which I'm sure most of you know, uh, entered the global stage quite late. It's a very isolated part of the Himalayas, surrounded on three sides by India and by the north side of, by China or the semi-autonomous region of Tibet, but really uh, uh, an area colonized by China, um, they realized by the 70s that they were not going to be able to afford to ignore the world. And so they had to try to negotiate how they were going to find their way in the world, how to enter the world, what mistakes to avoid as they thought about entering into a new sense of economy, how they were going to try to position themselves in the global economy, they asked themselves as Buddhists, as people who would have to ask themselves as part of their practice, towards what world are we working? For whom and for what are we doing this? For a few people? to enhance the power of those who already have too much power? For whom is this? Towards what are we working and how will we measure it? What will our metrics be? This resulted in an extraordinary experiment. I'm sure some of you know about it. It's what they call the gross national happiness, not the gross domestic product. How much have we grown? Which never asks, what kind of growth was there? Was there a good growth? Was there a bad growth? No. How much growth was there of any kind? If it's at least growth, it's good. No. To work towards the happiness of all. You know, how, much, how well have we done? How close have we become? Uh, Bhutan will have now, and it's really almost quixotic if you think about it, but really quite beautiful. Uh, they will have regular studies in which they try to hold accountable their progress towards what they think their economy should do, which is to provide for the happiness of all. In a way, you could say this, Bhutan attempts to marry material growth to spiritual growth. But by happiness, we don't mean, wow, I'm so happy. I got everything, you got nothing. Happiness is not the passing delight of getting what you want. It's not the pleasure of knowing you can get whatever you want, put the whole earth on a on-demand uh, status. Bhutan went back to their medieval Bhutanese Buddhist roots. And I quote from one of their documents, the main mechanism for sustaining the happiness of the people was to maintain a Buddhist outlook on life. Or as Schumacher says, it is to maintain wisdom. How much is enough? For whom? In what way? Echoing Schumacher, the cultivation of wisdom guides and shapes growth qualitatively and measures, measures such growth quantitatively. How much of what goods are sufficient for the overall flourishing of an ecology? So for example, in Bhutan, in the very fragile uh, ecologies of the Himalayas, the Himalayas, uh, has every known wildlife corridor protected. The land itself is well over two thirds wilderness and protected and will not be cultivated for human use. What then do we mean by spirituality of happiness? 
when happiness is not getting what I want, but it is lifting up all sentient beings. In this context, I'd like to reflect on spirituality by reading to you a piece from another one of Bhutan's documents on the gross national happiness. This is very beautiful. Ultimately, spirituality can be defined as compassion, an attitude that takes into consideration the well being of sentient beings which includes, of course, other people. Understood in this general way, a convergence between politics and spirituality cannot be controversial if spirituality is at the heart of governance. It rules out any major policies, any laws, any programs, that are not consistent with compassion and concern for others. Spirituality does not necessarily mean following a particular religion or a particular school of religion as a whole. It does not exclude plural identities. You know, I've always thought that it was one of the great symptoms of a healthy Buddhist practice, that that practice does not ask of the world, each and every one of you, whether you want to or not, should be a Buddhist. The Buddhist practice is, as a Buddhist, I want a good world and a good life for all sentient beings. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. So far from being motivated by an interest in our own happiness, so far from being motivated by what Adam Smith said it should be motivated by, self-love of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker, Bhutan's conception of wisdom-infused happiness is dedicated to the flourishing of the entire ecology of which human cultures are a part and in which they share their lives with all other lives interdependently. I quote now uh, the first elected prime minister of Bhutan Prime Minister Thinley. We have now clearly distinguished the happiness in the gross national happiness from the following pleasurable, feel good moods so often associated with that term. We know that true abiding happiness cannot exist while others suffer and comes only from serving others living in harmony with nature, realizing our own innate wisdom and the true and brilliant nature of our own minds. Wow, well, that's Earth Day. Well, that's an economy. That's a way to regulate markets. That's a way to make sure that we all have enough to eat and shelter and good books to read, and social spaces to make new friendships. That's a world in which we can live as all life, not just human life. A Buddhist ecology, we should remember, and as Prime Minister Thinley asks us to remember, is about interdependent arising, what the Buddha called Pratikyat Sumatpada, that all things move and grow together as a single net. And what is an ecology, if not this great Indra's net in which we all have our common destinies tied up with all other forms of life, that our very being is interbeing with all forms of life. This includes 
the social dimension of our human life, including politics and economics. They're part of the net. But the net is larger than humanity. Our economics and our politics should not be simply for us. That would make the human race as a species, a hungry ghost species. Towards what end are economic and political strivings? I conclude my time with you today uh, with a simple suggestion. Bhutan, a small kingdom of less than a million people, has the gross national happiness. In a way, it's the particulars of its program are rooted in Bhutanese culture. I don't think that we should expect ourselves to say, okay, well, first we have to root ourselves in Bhutanese culture so we can have a Bhutanese solution. I think that's not possible and not wise. But in our hearts and in our ambitions, we get a tremendous new insight into the ecological dimension of our economic and political activity. Maybe not gross national happiness, because that is to look after our nation, to make it great at the expense of others. That's not the Buddha way. The Buddha way is this, in our hearts, in our dreams, in our ambitions, gross earth happiness. Is this not also a way to understand our aspiration for the pure land, a place in which the gross national happiness, the gross earth happiness, pardon me, the gross earth happiness is the result of us giving ourselves over to the Buddha way and its other power. Maximum spiritual benefit for a maximum of life. That's not an anti-economic idea. That's not an anti-political idea. That is not spirituality completely divorced from our economic and political life. It is spirituality that suffuses the whole pure land that is the earth. So happy Earth Day, everybody. Thank you for sharing your time with me. I look forward to your questions. Again, it's an honor to be with my two fellow speakers. Thank you very much. I wish you happiness, be kind, and be healthy.